Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So today we are happy to have um, Dr. Um, Brian Williamson from um, <laughs> Kaiser Permanente um, Washington Re uh, Health Research Institute. So he is an assistant investigator in biostatistics and an expert uh, in statistical epidemiology, um, semi-parametric and non-parametric estimation theory and high-dimensional estimation and uh, prediction. So he's interested in developing robust procedures for statistic statistical inference when machine learning is used to address problems in um, public health. And today he's going to tell us something about um, inference in machine learning. So let's welcome Brian. Thank you, Jeff uh, for the excellent and very kind, too kind introduction. Uh, and thank, thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen, some slides, let's see. Are you seeing my slides now? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so today, yeah, I'm gonna be talking um, about sort of, you know, some of my research uh, in, in using machine learning uh, as part of inferential procedures uh, and also, you know, sort of beginning at a very high level, um, tying that into sort of a, a framework, um, you know, that's, that's come around a little bit recently uh, for doing it for sort of generally uh, when you have uh, when you're using machine learning as part of your uh, optimization or as part of your estimation. Uh, and I have two screens, so if I look over here, that's where I'm looking at the audience. Uh, that's a quote for you all. Uh, so if you want to follow along, uh, you can go to my website, um, bdwilliamson.github.io slash talks, uh, and you can follow along on the slides there. Um, there are references uh, that I put in sort of throughout the talk um, you know, that you can access at the end uh, of the slides um, or you know, sort of look at the slides at your own. Um, and first, I wanted to start off by acknowledging my collaborators. So uh, the bulk of the new research that I'm going to be presenting today, uh, I did with Peter Gilbert at Fred Hutch, uh, Noah Simon at and Margaret Brony at the University of Washington, uh, where I did my PhD. Um, and, and some of follow-up projects that I've worked on uh, with David Van Kessler at Emory, uh, Gene Fang, who is the at uh, UCSF. So, you know, 20 years ago, uh, a super famous statistician, Leo Breinman, uh, put out this really nice, I think, paper, uh, and it, but it was a little provocative, uh, talking about sort of two cultures of, of statistics. On one hand, being folks who were interested in doing inference, uh, and sort of that was the traditional paradigm where you posit a model uh, for the population, say a generalized linear model, uh, and you're interest, interested in doing inference on parameters. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, are those folks who are interested in doing predictions, so sort of agnostic uh, to any population model, trying to learn the best possible prediction function and you know, do the best that we can on future data uh, using that prediction function. So you know, that's where uh, Brunman sort of thought of machine learning as lying in this prediction uh, space, whereas things like linear models, uh, which some people view as machine learning, uh, would fall sort of more in this uh, traditional modeling space. Uh, and now we are 20 years uh, after that uh, paper came out. And just recently, a couple months ago, the last month, uh, the Journal of Observational Studies put out a special issue um, with 28 commentaries on this. So a really robust discussion, uh, which was super cool. And you can access that online. Um, but sort of some key takeaways, I think, from some of the commentaries, uh, you know, came out for me. And one thing is that tools that were originally developed in causal inference can help to bridge this gap that Brian saw between traditional you know, statistical inference based on these potentially very restrictive uh, population models and machine learning, which sort of makes no assumptions of, about the population, uh, but you know, maybe traditionally can't. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian, just yeah. here a little bit. Could, could you move your microphone a little bit closer to your your mouth? Your mouth? Yeah, because sure, there yeah, are so several comments saying that cannot hear you. Okay, 
Uh, can you hear any better now? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's see, let's see okay. All right, yeah, I will try. Hopefully this works. Um, but, you know, thank you for the suggestions. And sort of generally, Joe Fox, sorry, we didn't talk about this before. Um, should I be monitoring the chat for questions, uh, or are we going to leave questions until the end? Uh, we can go as like, um, so in the audience, if you have any like question, who want to talk and please like raise your hand and then you can allow to talk. So, um, if, um, otherwise we will leave for the questions until the end. Okay. I'll monitor the, the, okay. the, the chat if there's any like audio problem. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you uh, for everyone's patience uh, while we deal with this. It's, you know, even after two years of remote presentations, I uh, still don't have everything figured out. So uh, thank you for, uh, for your help. Uh, so, right. So, again, you know, thinking about uh, trying to use these tools uh, to bridge this gap between sort of traditional inference and traditional machine learning. So one you know, key takeaway from these commentaries is that, uh, and, and from causal inference is that, you know, what do we mean when we think about a model? Uh, and you know, I'm gonna abstract model to sort of the largest general, uh, largest possible definition, which is sort of a collection of distributions. And so you know, what we can do is think about uh, encoding information from our population. So say we know something uh, about our population, we can encode that into our but we're not going to necessarily make the same type of assumptions that we might make, say, when we uh, posit a linear regression model uh, for the population. So, so this is sort of a little bit further abstract uh, where we can encode information. And if we don't have it, uh, we can sort of leave this model as non-parameter. So just very, very good. Uh, the second sort of key tool uh, is to think about rather than positing a population model and then doing inference on parameters of that model uh, where the parameters are sort of defined, say, like using the mean regression or something. Uh, we can instead, you know, posit a population model and separately posit an estimate of interest. So, you know, in the linear regression case, if we assume a linear regression in the population, uh, you know, then our estimate of interest could be the regression parameters, right, which are sort of the the population sort of least squares of the same regression uh, relationship between our outcome parameters. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So this estimate that we're interested in, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be regression parameters. It can be more general. And then once we've identified an estimate that we're interested in, we tailor our procedure of doing estimation specifically to that estimate. So rather than saying, you know, I'm going to I want to use linear regression, so I'm going to assume a linear regression model and do inference on the regression parameters. Uh, we can sort of disentangle these things and posit a population model. Uh, think of an estimate that we're interested in doing inference on, and then estimate uh, that estimate. And I'll get into more specifics. I realize this is high level. I'll get into more specifics uh, in a particular example in a moment. And then, you know, once we've done this, once we've separated out, you know the population model from the estimate, uh, we can then, and, and the estimation procedure in particular, then we can think about how to incorporate machine learning uh, into this estimation uh, to reduce risk of model specification, you know, because one thing that we're often worried about when we're thinking about using linear regression, say, is what if there's not a linear model of the population? So how do we sort of get at, you know, underlying quantities that we're interested in? And so one, way of formalizing this uh, is through the framework called targeted learning. And this was first, again, developed in the context of causal inference. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, sort of a lot of these concepts came from causal inference, uh, economics, um, you know, in, in the last several years. And what does this framework look like? So first, uh, you develop your target parameter of interest, like I mentioned, and this really requires deep collaborations uh, with, with other scientists. And I'll go through in a particular example that I'm going to talk about today, tying to this, you know, how we arrived at a parameter that we were interested in. Um, and this definitely involved talking to collaborators. And so there's a lot of work up front here uh, to really determine what you're interested in. 
And then the model, uh, which I'm denoting here by script M, uh, just is a realistic collection of distributions. And so, you know, it, it has to be realistic to contain the true distribution, uh, P0. So sometimes we don't know anything about the population. So we just leave this, uh, this class of distributions very broad. Uh, but sometimes we know a lot. And so we can encode that into this realisticness. Um, you know, but this is very problem specific and population specific. And then the quantity of interest uh, is, in this sense, a summary of, of that dis true distribution. So, you know, we can define a statistical functional psi uh, that maps from the collection of distributions or from a distribution uh, to a vector of real numbers. And this defines the quantity that we're interested in. So psi of p0 is a summary measure um, of the of the population. And so again, I mean, like if we assume p0 is a linear regression model, um, then you know one per, per, uh, quantity that we might be interested in is those regression parameters. So sort of, you know, but you can think about this more generally. Say psi could be something like a mean, and so the population mean is, is a mapping from a distribution uh, to a mean. And, and again, I'll get into a specific, uh, several actually specific examples of this uh, uh, in a little bit. Oops. Uh, and then once you've defined this parameter of interest, which again requires a lot of work uh, with your collaborative interest, then you can, uh, do, you have to derive some analytic properties of this parameter. And one key quantity is the influence function, uh, which has ties to parametric uh, problems as well, and there, you know, especially so in, in linear regression, the influence function looks like contains the Fisher information and the score equation. Um, but sort of generally, this influence function is something you know that you can that you can consider for each uh, target parameter that you might be interested in. And additionally, you can determine if there are anything else that you need to estimate. So often, you know, these nuisance parameters that you might be interested in estimating as part of your procedure might be something like an initial mean. Once you've determined what you want to estimate, then you need to determine sort of how you are doing that estimation. What are the components that could be the best part of that? And then the third step in this in this framework is to actually do the estimation. So you know you can choose your procedures to estimate use this parameters. So something like maybe machine learning, maybe the lasso, maybe so if one of your quantities that you're interested in is a conditional mean. Uh, you know, oftentimes machine learning is really helpful. But, uh, you know, sort of classical training uh, in machine learning tells us that we can't simply just, you know, use machine learning and then do inference based on that. Uh, and that's oftentimes the case. So, you know, we may often in machine learning apply a fairness trade on uh, to get at, you know, this quantity that we're interested in, say it's a condition uh, for, for estimation. But if that condition meaning maybe isn't the same uh, as the quantity of interest, and there's maybe that wasn't the right class that was so uh, Ryan, sorry to interrupt you. We again have this audio problem. <laughs> so um uh, yeah, okay. Let's see if I if I move it a little bit closer, does that help at all? Like, I'm like almost as close as I can go to my <laughs> yeah. Um I don't know. Some people say if we don't use like the um, the microphone, does it get better? I don't know. Well, okay. So I will try that. Um, yeah, I hopefully, won't lose all my. I'm gonna lose all my windows. I think. <laughs> uh, let's see. Now it's really good. <laughs> really? Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, and am I still sharing? the screen with my slides no okay so i need to stop sharing then and share again okay All right, uh, now are you seeing my slides? Yes. And is the audio better at all? Yeah, much better, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, fascinating. Um, all right, uh, well, we 
we will go with this then. If you don't mind, could you <laughs> start from two? Like, um, yeah, the second part, because that's where it gets kind of like bad and we couldn't quite hear that part. I'm sorry. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, again, thanks everybody for letting me know and, uh, and for bearing with these. Yeah, technical difficulties. So, um, right, so to recap a little bit, um, you know, the first step in this framework of targeted learning is to, you know, define what your parameter of interest is. And this, this parameter of interest is a summary measure of your true distribution, uh, sort of generally speaking. Could be something like a mean, uh, could be something more complicated, and that's uh, the example that I'll go into uh, in detail. Once you have that parameter of interest, uh, there's some work that needs to be done to define analytic properties of it. And you know, thankfully, people have done a lot of this work already for many uh, different parameters that you might be inter interested in. So often in the literature, there will already be um, these things like the influence function, uh, which is a key quantity in terms of uh, doing inference um, on, on, these, uh, on these parameters. Um, and the influence function you can think of in so tying sort of to a concrete example in parametric uh, linear regression, this influence function involves the Fisher information and involves the score equation, you know, sort of classical um, objects in linear regression. And so, you know, this idea of an influence function um, extends to sort of a non-parametric uh, collection of distributions, a really large class, rather than making any assumption, uh, any parametric type assumptions. Uh, and so this idea of the influence function carries forward. Uh, so in linear regression, right, um, the variance of the asymptotic variance of a regression parameter estimate uh, is tied to this influence function. You can write out uh, the asymptotic variance as the expectation of the, um, of the basically the squared influence function, if you're just thinking about one regression parameter. And it works out to be the inverse Fisher information, um, you know, divided by the, uh, by the outcome or the, the errors variance. But this idea of the influence function tying into inference uh, is more general than that. And so we'll hold sort of for, for a wide variety of problems. And so in addition to this influence function, there may be pieces of this estimator that are complex and that need to be estimated. So something like a conditional mean uh, often pops up uh, here. Um, conditional density functions, things like this. So, so part of the work of figuring out how to do estimation is to figure out what things you need to estimate. And then once you have identified everything that you need to estimate, then you get to choose how to do that estimation. And this is where machine learning can come in. Uh, so when you're thinking about, you know, I, I want to estimate a conditional mean, uh, you can do that, you know, using machine learning in a lot of cases. Machine learning is really good at estimating conditional means. And so we don't really necessarily need to make any assumptions on that uh, conditional mean to do good estimation. What we then need to do, and to do inference, what we then need to do is make sure that this procedure sort of works uh, in some sense for our parameter of interest. And so uh, there have been, you know, there's a large literature on basically you know, identifying, so for machine learning, you make a bias variance trade-off for, for doing estimations, say, um, and that bias variance trade-off is good for the quantity that you're going after with the machine learning. So say you're estimating a conditional mean. Uh, that bias variance trade-off is good for the conditional mean, uh, but if your population quantity isn't the conditional mean, um, if it's some function sort of involving the conditional mean, then maybe that bias variance trade-off that you made while good for the conditional mean wasn't the right one for your parameter that you're interested in. And so there are a bunch of different procedures um, for sort of correcting that bias because your eventual procedure is gonna inherit any bias that, uh, that crept in during the sort of initial estimation. So, so there are ways to de-bias uh, this, you know, this quantity when you've used machine learning that then gives you valid inference at the end of the day. So sort of circumventing this problem with classical machine learning where we've all been taught that you, you can't do inference. Um, you have to sort of do this work and often this will involve the influence function um, to do inference uh, in these cases. And then finally, once you've estimated uh, your parameter of interest, you can do inference on it. And, you know, and sort of all of these steps and details here um, 
are, are given in this reference, this book by Mark Vanderland and Sherry Rose, uh, which is a super good reference um, for sort of targeted learning in general. And this general framework applies to any parameter that you might be interested in. And again, sort of maps this idea of, you know, encoding knowledge about the population, uh, figuring out the target parameter that you're interested in, and then figuring out how you're going to estimate that parameter. Uh, and now I'm going to go into sort of a specific example um, from my own work on, on how we did this for a class um, of parameters that you might be interested in. So to motivate this, uh, I'll give two examples. So one is in HIV prevention. So the antibody-mediated prevention study uh, consists of two clinical trials uh, that actually released primary efficacy results recently. Uh, testing a antibody against HIV uh, and seeing how well uh, that antibody prevented HIV infection. And here uh, in, in the picture, we have uh, a picture of, of an HIV envelope protein. And so, you know, pictures like this have come up quite often recently uh, because SARS-CoV-2 uh, has a similar protein called Spike, um, which sort of sticks out uh, from the virus and mediates or helps with entry into cells. And so for HIV, we might say, you know, are there mutations that could happen in particular regions? So each of these colored regions on the, on the envelope protein, uh, you know, is a region where there might be mutations. And are any of those mutations sort of ad advantageous uh, for the virus escaping this antibody that we're studying? And, you know, this could inform vaccine design in the future. And similarly for COVID vaccines, you know, are there mutations that are important uh, in predicting whether or not that particular virus can escape the vaccine. A second question uh, comes from cardiology, uh, where we're interested in predicting um, whether or not people are going to be readmitted uh, to the hospital far following a cardiac uh, admission to the hospital. It's super expensive for both patients and the medical system to have these readmissions. So if we can predict people uh, who are likely to, to be readmitted and intervene early, uh, then we can potentially save a lot of time, money, um, and, and complications. And so the question here was, you know, can we identify important factors for doing this prediction so that we can make sure to measure those and so that we can, uh, you know, intervene earlier uh, in these patients, um, you know, uh, encounters with the medical system. And so these motivating questions led us to the notion of variable importance. And so, you know, what is that? Uh, that's sort of the first <laughs> question that we have to think about when engaging with this framework, uh, where we're trying to define now the parameter that we're interested in. So what is it? Uh, it's really thinking about the uh, quantifying, so trying to come up with a number that tells us about the contributions of a variable or a set of variables to something. And you know what are those contributions? Typically, to prediction. So both of the, um, the examples that I mentioned a moment ago are thinking about uh, the importance of variables in predicting some outcome. So one was, uh, you know, whether or not this virus can be neutralized by our antibody and or by our vaccine. Uh, and the other was, you know, thinking about important variables for predicting hospital readmissions. Uh, but there are you know, sort of two general notions of this type of contribution. And one is that I'll call extrinsic importance, is say you're given an algorithm, say you fit a random forest, um, how important are variables within this random forest? You know, it's a super useful uh, quantity for figuring out how the random forest works. Um, but, but that notion of, of variable importance is very much tied to the procedure. Uh, so a, a second and complementary type of information might be, and what I'm going to call intrinsic importance, is what's the importance of these variables? What's the contribution to predictions by the best possible algorithm? So say I had uh, access to the entire population uh, and I could learn the population prediction function, sort of what are the important variables in that uh, prediction function? And this second piece we can do inference on. And so the work that I'm going to be talking about today is focused on a model agnostic notion of intrinsic variable importance and, and doing inference on that. And again, sort of tying in uh, back to these motivating examples, uh, for the cardiology example, we can ask the question, uh, is it worth extracting notes from text 
uh, or text from notes, sorry, from the electronic health record for the sake of predicting these readmissions, because it's, it's a lot of work uh, to, to scan the text. Uh, and so is it worth doing that? Are there things that we can learn from the text that are important? Uh, and then for the HIV example, is it worth collecting, say, a given covariate or looking at a particular mutation uh, for the sake of predicting neutralization sensitivity? So whether or not this virus uh, is, is susceptible to neutralization by the antibody that we're studying. So, you know, the way that we came about this, uh, to, or the way that we approached thinking about this was to start simple and, and go more complex. So let's consider now um, a data unit X and Y, uh, which is distributed according to some true distribution P0. Uh, and I'm gonna make no more assumptions about P0. Uh, our outcome of interest is, is denoted Y. And our covariates X, there are P of them. And so the goal here is to both estimate and do inference on the importance of a subset of variables. Uh, so, you know, S here is going to denote the collection of variables that we're interested in. Uh, and, and so this collection, uh, XJ, um, for all of those Js uh, in, in the set that I'm interested in, is going to define sort of the variable points. So how important are these variables with index in S in predicting my outcome? Sort of the first question we asked ourselves was, how might we do this in linear regression? So say that I'm gonna fit a linear regression model, uh, what should I do for variable points? And so, you know, one approach would be to fit a linear regression of my outcome on all of the variables. Uh, that gives me a prediction function that I'm gonna call mu hat of x. So it takes in the covariates, returns a predicted uh, outcome value. And do the same thing, where now I'm fitting a linear regression on a reduced collection of variables. So here at x minus s is all the variables that I don't care about. So, uh, so x s, right, is the ones that I do. So I'm, I'm removing those um, and fitting the linear regression again. This gives me a second prediction function, um, mu hat sub s, which again takes in covariates and returns a predicted outcome. And then I can compare the fitted values of these two regression functions. So comparing, um, you know, fitting to the data, uh, these, two, these two prediction functions. And I can do that in several ways. One way is using the ANOVA decomposition uh, you know, from classical linear models. And the other way is to use a difference in R squared values. And you know, specifically what this looks like uh, for the difference in R squareds in particular uh, is you know, a, a contrast in these two R squareds where each R squared is defined as one minus the ratio of the empirical average of my outcome minus the prediction function squared. Uh, divided by the uh, the empirical variance. And this sort of gives me a summary measure, right, you know, using these linear regression models of how important the variables uh, in S are. And I can do inference on this. This has been well studied. Uh, I can do inference by testing the difference in R squared, seeing if it's different from zero. And I can get a valid confidence interval for this difference in R squared as well. And so inference in this case is straightforward. And so we thought about then generalizing this to a, a sort of population or a model agnostic population parameter. And so here I've listed out what that looks like. So this parameter, psi zero s, takes in a distribution and returns a number. So this parameter is defined as the ratio of the true expected squared difference between two prediction functions. First, um, mu zero being the true conditional mean. So the true expectation of outcome given all the covariates. And the second prediction function being the true reduced conditional mean. So the conditional outcome of, or the conditional expectation of the outcome given the reduced set of covariates. And then the denominator of, of this um, parameter of interest is the, the marginal outcome variance. And you can think about this then, right? Tying back to, um, to what we saw on the previous slide as a non-parametric extension. Uh, of the linear regression ANOVA parameter. And you can also think about this as a difference in population R squared values, because with a little algebra, we can rewrite this parameter as, as this quantity here, where it's looking at now population versions of the empirical versions of uh, empirical version of R squared that I showed on the previous slide. Okay, so now we have a parameter that we might be interested in estimating you know, the population, the difference in population R squared values. And, you know, 
like if our true population is a linear model, then this corresponds exactly with the linear regression uh, variable importance that we considered. And so this you know, could be of interest. And in fact, um, when talking with our collaborators, this was something, a parameter that was of interest in some settings. Okay, so now we have a parameter that we might be interested in. What do we do next? Uh, we figure out how we do inference on that. So, you know, I have two quantities that I need to ask, well, three quantities that I need to estimate. Two of those are conditional means. So mu zero and mu zero s are the two population conditional means. Uh, and then I have the outcome variance, which is easy to estimate. So say I construct estimators of those two population conditional means. And here I can use machine learning uh, because I wanna do a really good job of estimating those. Uh, what would happen if I just plugged in those estimators to an empirical version uh, of my population parameter. So here is an initial estimator, psi n s, which is the empirical average. So replacing all um, population averages with empirical averages. The empirical average of my estimated uh, conditional mean function, difference in the conditional mean functions squared, and then divide by the empirical outcome variance. You know, this seems like a reasonable estimator. Uh, but it's going to have some asymptotic bias. So this is where that bias variance trade-off piece that I mentioned comes in. Uh, because, you know, we may do a bias variance trade-off for estimating each of these um, mu sub n's, uh, but that might not be the right bias variance trade-off for estimating psi n. So we need to deal with this asymptotic bias. And one way to do this uh, is using influence function based debiasing. So that's one of the methods uh, for basically taking your initial estimator and targeting, targeting it uh, towards your parameter of interest. And it turns out that when we do this, based on the influence function uh, for this parameter, the final estimator, the updated estimator, looks like, looks like this. So it's actually a difference uh, in, in empirical R squared. And I'm going to pull that out on the next slide. So this estimator that we've come up with, which is the you know the influence function debiased estimator, uh, is actually the same estimator we would have gotten if we looked at the difference in R squared representation uh, of this population parameter, right? So I mentioned that there's a population equivalence between the ANOVA decomposition and the difference in R squareds. Uh, so if we used that difference in R squared representation, we could actually just plug this in, uh, plug in the estimates. So there's no need to debias, in other words, this difference in R squared based estimator. And why does this happen? Uh, it turns out, you know, if you look at expansions uh, of estimator minus the truth, um, estimating these true conditional means is only a second order issue. So as long as you're estimating the conditional means well enough, so assuming a quarter rate of convergence from your estimator to the true value, um, our estimator of difference in R squareds actually behaves as if these values are known, uh, which is, you know, was super surprising to us. And so under some regularity conditions, one of them being uh, this convergence rate of the estimated conditional mean functions to the true ones, uh, our estimator here, based on the difference in R squareds, is both consistent and non-parametric efficient. And so, you know, in other words, we can take this centered and scaled version of our estimator uh, and you know, have an estimator variance for it and do inference on it. And so details about this uh, are, in, are in a paper um, that I published several years ago now uh, that's at the, uh, at the end of the slide. Um, and so turning back now to, uh, to the antibody-mediated prevention trials, you know, what does this look like in practice? So uh, here, to prepare for these trials, we were interested in determining uh, important mutations to focus on in the primary um, efficacy analysis. Uh, you know, to pre preserve statistical power rather than looking across the whole genome for mutations at each uh, position in the genome, uh, we wanted to sort of pre-screen those. And so we have a publicly available data set of about 600 uh, viruses. And our outcome of interest is resistance, uh, you know, so whether or not a particular virus is resistant to neutralization by the antibody, meaning that the antibody doesn't work um, for killing off that virus sort of in a petri dish. And so again, like I mentioned, one of our goals is to pre-screen uh, these variables for inclusion. And so we have 800 variables. These correspond to both uh, individual amino acid features uh, and some other variables and also 13 groups that we predefined uh, based on sort of the scientific background. 
And so what we're going to do here is estimate these two conditional mean functions using the super learner, uh, which is a particular implementation of model stacking or ensembling uh, that uses cross-validation. And so we're going to use a large number of machine learning algorithms. We use random forests, uh, boosted trees, uh, lasso, things like that. And then we're going to use these estimates uh, to estimate and do inference on variable importance. And here are some other references that sort of talk through more of the details of this procedure. And one thing that you can think about when you're fitting a super learner is looking at uh, sort of the prediction performance for all of the, uh, the candidate learners in, in the super learner. So here I'm showing that random forests actually perform the best uh, out of all of the individual learners here, boosted trees, uh, elastic net, and uh, random forests. Uh, and, and also the outcome is binary. So R squared, you know, you might be thinking maybe doesn't make very much sense. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. Again, sort of showing now uh, uh, cross-validated ROC curves, showing that the super learner uh, actually performs quite well uh, in relation to that individual random forest that performed the best. Um, so, you know, it might be something uh, worth using. And so here are the overall results um, with respect to R squared. So again, we're predicting whether or not a given virus is resistant to this antibody. And I'm just gonna ask you to focus on the top two groups of variables. So these are, these are groups of amino acid features. Uh, group one is, so VRCO1 is the antibody uh, that we're studying in AMP. Uh, that's the VRCO1 binding footprint. So sorry, here. Sorry, yeah, there's a yeah. question from the audience. Sure, go ahead. Um, sorry. So how did Brian construct the super learner? Good question. So the super learner is, um, yeah, uh, let's see, are you able to unmute? Uh, and He's on mute. No. Uh, Andreas, you can talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening from Germany. Um, Brian, very nice talk. Uh, Thank you. In your case, how do you construct your super learner? Uh, there are a couple of approaches how to do it. Uh, um, did you do some specific regression across the different machines to construct the super learner? Uh, can you be a little bit specific there? Maybe I've just missed it. No, good question. I, I didn't say how I did that. <laughs> um, so here, you know, like I mentioned, uh, my candidate prediction functions are, you know, different versions, different flavors of random forests, uh, elastic nets, and boosted trees. Um, you know, and, and the ensembling algorithm that I used is uh, non-negative uh, uh, non -negative, non -negative log likelihood loss. So I'm, I'm okay. doing sort of, yeah, optimization on top to combine uh, the, the estimators in the final super learner. Yeah. Does that okay. answer your question? Please. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. And using, um, using cross-validation uh, to do that. Yeah, and cross-validation yeah. within to select the tuning parameters for say, yeah, the lasso, yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, is there another one? Yeah, Paul has a question too. Uh, Paul, you can talk. Hi, just a quick question. Uh, can you tell me why you're using uh, in the previous slides, R squared instead of adjusted R squared? So adjusted R squared being um, a correction. You know, like the linear regression version. Yeah, with aggression. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, and I guess I'm not, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what that correction looks like. I haven't thought about the, R, the adjusted R squared in a, in a minute, <laughs> um, but that correction in the population, right? That's sort of tied to the specific procedure um, that you're looking at. And I guess I, it's not immediately clear to me what that correction looks like in this population version, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. But definitely if you posited a, um, a linear regression or a generalized linear regression model, um, you could use something like the adjusted R squared in that case, for sure. Thank you. And there is another question, just a second. Um,
Jonah, you can talk. Okay, so the question is, how does one avoid overfitting? Um, that is, the population is rather small, 800 instance, instances in 13 groups, or did I miss something here? Yeah, so um, let's see. Right, so here we have uh, 600 observations uh, and 800 individual features. So yes, you know, quite small population number of observations compared to the the feature set size. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at, you know, using cross validation uh, for to sort of handle overfitting. Um, yeah, but that's on the training set, right? On the uh, on the set, you use all the data in doing the cross validation. So. So actually, yeah, I, I didn't um, I didn't show a second estimator of variable importance, which is sort of an outer an additional layer of cross validation. Um, so where you um, let's see, I'll go back here. Yeah, rather than using the entire empirical distribution to estimate these R squareds, you can estimate um, you know use cross validation. Uh, to estimate these uh, conditional mean functions and then use an outer layer of cross validation where you only estimate the conditional mean on the training data and estimate the R squared on the testing data, you know, breaking uh, this, um, yeah, this dependence between those two. And that actually works much better in practice uh, than using the entire, you know, training, doing the training and doing the R squared estimation on, on the same data set. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one can only do what one can do, yes. yes. Right, right. Yeah, but cross validation is very important. And it's actually also very important for testing. Right. And so did you ever validate this then on a totally blinded independent set that it would recon? Yeah, so in the um, in one of the papers, so in, uh, in the paper that I wrote with Craig Magray and colleagues, uh, we did uh, validate this on sort of two holdout sets um, oh, yeah. and it worked exactly the same. Yeah, Okay. But good cool. question. Thank you. Okay, there was no more questions. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Okay, yeah, so uh, drawing attention um, to two feature groups, the two being the binding footprint of VRCO1. So this is where the antibody attaches onto the HIV virus. And the second being uh, the CD4 binding site. So where, you know, the virus attaches onto CD4 T cells, and that you know often uh, mediates entry into those cells. Uh, we identified those two as being two of the most important groups. But again, you know, this is R squared. Maybe it's not uh, super relevant for a binary outcome. And so that led us to think about you know variable importance with respect to other target parameters. Uh, which I'll go over in a moment. Uh, <laughs> this plot is just showing the important regions that we identified within that spike protein or within that envelope protein, um, and, and showing, you know, as one of the uh, one of the participants asked about independent data sets, you know, these are showing um, prediction performance ROC curves on those two uh, independent data sets, and then these are sort of averaged uh, variable importances across those. So, and and they were quite consistent across the two independent sets. But, you know, again, like I mentioned just a moment ago, this is, we could think about other measures of variable importance instead of just R squares. Uh, coming at it from the same direction, which is let's think about a target parameter that we're interested in and then figure out how to do inference on that. So, you know, the generalized uh, view is to choose a measure of quote unquote predictiveness. So R squared, for example, measures how predictive uh, a set of features is for predicting the outcome. And this can be task specific. Uh, so in general, I'm gonna define a function V uh, that takes a prediction function F and a distribution P uh, and defines that predictiveness. So larger values of V are better. Uh, and I'm gonna define two function classes. Uh, script F is just a really big class of candidate prediction functions. And script F minus S is all of those functions in the bigger class uh, that ignore the components that I care about, that I'm interested in variable importance for. 
Based on these, I can define sort of analogs of those population conditional means. So uh, F0 is going to maximize this predictiveness over the big prediction function class with respect to my true distribution P0. Uh, and F0S is going to do the same, but over this reduced uh, prediction function class. And in the case of R squared, F0 and F0S correspond to those conditional means that, that I talked about just a few moments ago. So sort of you can think about these oftentimes as conditional means, but they may be more general. And then to define variable importance, we can just look at the contrast or the difference in predictiveness values. So the true variable importance is just going to be the difference in predictiveness between the, um, the sort of best possible prediction function F0 and the reduced uh, prediction function F0S. And this is always going to be greater than or equal to 0 just based on how we've defined uh, these maximizers. And um, so, you know, what types of measures fall into this framework? One is R squared, like we've talked about uh, before. So there, the, the function V that measures predictiveness is this ratio uh, that we've talked about. So the ratio of the, uh, the squared expected difference between outcome and prediction function divided by the empirical variance. Uh, but for binary outcomes, we can think about a bunch of different ways to measure predictiveness. The first being classification accuracy, where here the predictiveness measure just measures the probability that my predictions are equal to the outcome values. Uh, area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, or AUC, uh, where here I'm measuring the probability that I can basically order um, the, the predictions correctly. So for two independent errors of observations, X and Y, one, one being a case, the other being a control, I get the correct ordering. And then I can define something that I'm calling pseudo R squared, which is basically, you know, sort of a, a binary outcome version of R squared uh, that's looking at like a callback libeler type um, information gain from including variables that I'm interested in. And so all of these sort of fall into this general framework where I have a predictiveness measure that I'm interested in. Uh, and each of these also has nuisance components that I need to estimate. So, you know, a, a prediction function or a conditional mean uh, in the case of R squared and, and the outcome variance. Uh, here in classification accuracy, just this prediction function and, and so on. And so, you know, again, just like with R squared, we can ask how to do inference uh, on this quantity. So now psi zero S is sort of a general difference between two measures of predictiveness. And we can go about it in much the same way that we did for R squared. So, you know, let's construct estimators that I'm going to call FN and FNS of those two population maximizers. And here again, I can use machine learning uh, to do this. Then think about plugging in, just like I did uh, in the case of difference in R squared, uh, to an empirical version or um, really a cross validated uh, empirical version uh, of this sort of population difference in the predictiveness measures. Uh, and then, you know, I can think about doing inference uh, using the influence function. So, you know, Thinking about this like R squared, we saw in the case of R squared that, that we didn't have to do any debiasing. The debiasing was already done for us, or, or estimating the Fs was a second order problem. And it turns out to be the same sort of in this general case. Uh, and why is that? So I can write out uh, my difference in predictiveness measures basically as the sum of two different terms. The first term being um, you know, the contribution of estimating the, the empirical distribution. Uh, and the second term being the contribution of estimating um, the prediction function itself. And I can study these terms using you know, tools uh, that have been developed over time. So the green term here, the contribution from having estimated the empirical distribution, uh, I can use the functional delta method to study that. And the blue term, because of how I've defined uh, my, my population measure of variable importance uh, is going to be second order, just like it was in the R squared case, because this function F0 maximizes predictiveness uh, over my function class. And so in some sense, you know, a, a derivative of that, uh, of that predictiveness measure is going to be zero, the first, or the first order derivative of that, you know, in, in sort of a heuristic sense. And so again, I can treat these population prediction functions as known 
uh, in studying asymptotic behavior of this estimator. And so I can get confidence intervals, I can sort of use valid, uh, you know, normal type theory to do that. And again, details in this uh, are in a paper that was just published in the fall. And so, you know, now we can look at this full picture uh, for the antibody mediated prevention trials, where now I'm including in these other two panels, uh, variable importance with respect to accuracy and variable importance with respect to AUC. And in all three cases, uh, we're identifying these first two variable groups. So the binding footprint where the antibody binds to the virus and the CD4 binding sites where the virus binds to CD4 T cells. In all three of these cases, we're identifying those two as the most important. Uh, but only in the AUC case, sort of are we getting separation between those uh, and the remainder of the variable sets. And so this you know, has some implications uh, for how we sort of move forward uh, with these variable importance estimates. So the first is that you know, based on the totality of evidence from these and from prior studies, uh, you know, mutations in these two different groups of sites appear to be important. But, you know, sort of importantly and crucially, these results, like the point estimates and maybe even the, you know, p-values that you can get from a, from a test, a hypothesis test of variable importance, may be different based on the measure you choose. And this is a phenomenon that we see in a wide variety of cases, right? For example, if you're fitting, uh, if you're looking at logistic regression or a linear regression in the case of a binary outcome, trying to estimate the risk difference or an odds ratio, you can see different conclusions. Uh, based on the summary measure that you choose. So this is just another example of that kind of phenomenon. And so you have to be really careful then when you're defining uh, what measure of variable importance you're gonna use. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, we've extended this. Um, so with David Benkester and some other colleagues extended this to look at multiple regimens, uh, multiple antibody regimens against HIV. And we're also looking at this um, for COVID-19 prevention. Um, and, and another extension that I've considered is thinking about uh, variable importance with correlated features. So, so far, uh, what, we've, what I've talked about is variable importance of a set of variables relative to the remaining variables or relative to the full uh, covariant vector. But this becomes a problem when some of these variables are highly correlated. So for example, you could consider two very highly correlated variables, uh, age and foot size for predicting toddler's reading ability. So, you know, both age and foot size appear to be potentially important. But, uh, you know, based on the definition that I've provided so far, we would say the true importance of age would be zero uh, in this model. So if they're perfectly correlated age and foot size, uh, because I've, I've kept foot size uh, in the model and sort of kicked out age. So age wouldn't appear to be important because they're perfectly correlated. And the reverse is also true. Uh, if I considered foot size alone and left age in, then I would think that foot size is not important, where really, you know, they're both important. And so the idea that we had uh, to handle this was to average the contribution, the predictiveness contribution uh, of a given feature over all possible combinations of that feature with the others. Uh, and so here, you know, in this example, the true importance of age uh, would be the average of the increase in predictiveness from adding age to foot size and the increase in predictiveness of using age over nothing. So using all of the possible ways that age can contribute uh, to, to the true population prediction model. And I, and I published this um, a couple of years ago now with Gene Feng, uh, and it's using this sort of notion of Shapley values, uh, which are a popular idea in game theory. And so I'll just close with a couple of thoughts uh, on sort of the general notions and then variable importance in particular. So, you know, I prefaced this whole talk with thinking about how can we look at uh, doing inference using machine learning, where we use sort of a framework where we encode knowledge about the population. We specify a summary measure of that population that we're interested in doing inference on, and then separately we go about doing estimation, and that can include machine learning. Uh, and, you know, throughout this talk, I've, I've looked at variable importance in, in particular and noted that for the case of variable importance, we don't actually have to do any fancy debiasing. That all has happened um, under the hood for us. And you know, that happens in some contexts, it doesn't happen in others. So, so sometimes we have to use these debiasing techniques, I like targeted learning framework, uh, you know, to get valid inference. Uh, but with variable importance, we can do um, 
valid inference on population variable importance defined in a variety of ways. So for example, R squared or AUC, um, we can use machine learning to do that. Uh, and we can get valid inference and hypothesis tests at the end of the day. Um, and so if you're interested in doing the variable importance piece in particular, uh, I have an R and Python package uh, available on both CRAN and PyPI um, and on GitHub. Um, and you can check out my website uh, for, for and my GitHub page for more information. Um, and the final two slides are references, so I'll stop now uh, and take questions. And thank you all again uh, for your time.